Welcome, and thank you for joining our Agile Live webinar series on collaboration that scales, connecting teams and programs via essential conversations. My name is Andy Powell, a product evangelist for version 1, and I'll be hosting today's event. I looked at the uh, questions submitted ahead of time, and it's clear that figuring out how to get everyone talking to each other in the right way isn't an easy task. How should we be thinking about collaboration as we work to deliver software across our many Agile teams? Well, to help us answer uh, this question and the others we're having, I'm excited to introduce you to David Hussman, a well-known Agile coach, instructor, and the owner of DevJam. Some of you may know David as the dude. Uh, David, thanks so much for being here today. My pleasure, Andy. Our goal is for you to leave today's session with some new ideas on techniques and tools that you can put to use tomorrow. Then next week, Bob Benson, a product manager with version 1, and I will demonstrate how version 1 can help facilitate collaboration across your entire development lifecycle. Before we get started, I would like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. This presentation will last about 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. For those of you who haven't used GoToWebinar before, you will notice at the top of the control panel on that left-hand side that orange button with double arrows. You can click that button to collapse the control panel during the presentation so it doesn't interfere with your viewing. All of your lines are muted throughout the presentation, so if you have questions, please send them in using the control panel, and at the end of the presentation, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions in advance. Uh, we'll address some of those during the course of the webinar as well and include those in questions at the end uh, if David hasn't already answered them. Finally, today's webinar is being recorded, and we will send you an email in a few days with a link to view the recording of today's event. So on that note, let's get started. Okay, thanks Andy. Um, as Andy said, um, one of the things he's doing is monitoring the background, so if people do have questions, if there's any technical problems, you can just chime in and he'll help me with that. Um, we do want to make sure that we answer questions, so I tried to put together material that spoke to some of the things you submitted. Um, in general, when I was asked to do this talk, I thought that collaboration oftentimes can become kind of fluffy. And the title is intentionally chosen to say, how do you start the right conversations? Because that's a dimension of fostering collaboration. Um, I'm here in South Minneapolis at DevJam, and DevJam does a bunch of different things. We coach, and we teach, and we build products. And the last piece is, I think, an important thing to always talk about, because this is very real for us. We're not um, just out there teaching and preaching. We're acting and doing and learning. And we know that even in our small teams in-house here, fostering collaboration is essential. One of the things we do is we try and set up for the Twin Cities community these larger discussions. So we have this local group called Twin Cities Practical Agility. The link is on the bottom here. And this is an open space that we hosted. And it's one more way of starting, trying to start all the right conversations in fact, we don't really typically have speakers. We have someone called the chief discussion starter. And that person's job, like my job today, is to try and get people having the right conversations, fostering that sense of collaboration. Collaboration is more than proximity. Um, we're, we're so inspired by this that we're kind of creating this thing called a maker space because we want people just in our little local part of the world in South Minneapolis coming together to collaborate to produce things. That's if I summed up one of the things we're doing and one of the things we're also doing in our coaching is trying to get people to think about producing. What's the least amount of process that drives the highest level of collaboration and production? Uh, this is a listing of some of the companies we work with. Now, the idea of showing you this is to not woo or impress anyone. It's to speak to the wild diversity that's on here. So there's groups that do medical devices. 
and there's groups in the financial space, and there's groups in the, the entertainment world. And e each one of those ecosystems is significantly different. Sometimes we'll be working in a very large organization with a very small team, and that's one dimension I want to, want to talk about. Other times we're working across multiple teams, so it's not just a project, it's a program. Other times we're working across organizations, and that's kind of the frame I want to use for today. So um, also what Andy, one of, picking up on one of the things Andy said, afterwards we're going to try and put together some kind of a one pager, and you'll be able to get that from the version one in the DevJam site, that speaks to like these different dimensions and how to get people having the right conversations and promote collaboration. So the first one is this idea of within a team, or you could say within a team or within a project, a project team. Now, projects sometimes have more than one team. And I've kind of broken the dialogue up into just a few things that we can get into like a 40-minute window. Like how do you start the right product conversations that promote collaboration around building the right thing? How do you start the right daily conversations that get people connected and hopefully collaborating? How do you figure out how to learn together? And then reflection and learning sort of go together. But I broke them out a little bit because um, like your questions and my experience, I see that there are a lot of people using Agile methods who are oftentimes just seeing the ceremony and not seeing the outcomes. The second level I want to speak to is this idea of across teams, or in a lot of companies it's called a program. Multiple teams coming together to produce one thing. It might be a single product, or it might be a group of teams working on discrete things that come together into a collection of things that form a product. I also want to speak to some of the realities around there around architecture because I don't think architecture is dead. I just think it's different, like analysis. And there are a lot of places that we're coaching that are scaled up where they're not collaborating across teams. Individual teams are doing well, but cross teams is where some of the challenges exist. Oftentimes, we're finding that's where the higher level value is. And then this idea that I think is kind of foreign that I would like to challenge us all on, which is outside of teams, or people might call that portfolio, organizational. And those are bigger questions, oftentimes, that aren't even being asked correctly, or maybe we haven't given people the information they need to feel okay to ask a certain question, and we'll get to that a little bit later, especially on this investment side. So if we start out with within a team or within a project, it puts us in the space that I think a lot of agile thinking, a lot of team-based discussion, a lot of the literature, certainly the origin of the movement was about teams and individuals and supporting individuals. I'm going to introduce one more frame, because this is something I think very much speaks to promoting long-term collaboration. Or the way I've phrased it here is getting ready, helping people kind of pick a process, something that's unique to them, that works for them, have them come up with some product thinking, and then figure out how to do like just enough planning so that they can step into getting productive. A lot of groups that I see that are struggling with collaboration, they get lost in kind of this early planning back here, or they rush into planning too fast without thinking about what they're doing. Uh, I saw that enough that I actually changed my email signature to say, if you don't know where you're going, it's easy to iteratively not get there. And then this getting productive piece is where I think you know, you could say it's somewhere between you know, the first handful of iterations if you're working iteratively or first couple months or something. How do a group of people come together and succeed? What, what actually ties them together? What conversations and forums bring them together? And then the harder piece is how do they stay productive across time? And that becomes like a measure of collaboration. One of the things we've done with groups, just to mention real quick, is we've come up with very simple like little health measures, tests, documents to hand out to people at like retrospectives or something with a simple set of questions like are you proud of your work? 
Do you feel like your process is helping you learn? Is your code base responsive? You know, five maybe simple questions, weighted three points each, and just start pulling across time to just get a feel for, it's pretty important for people to be proud of what they're doing. Collaboration doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in context, especially where people are feel like they have a common goal. So let's look at just one of these and dig deeper into tools. So let's start with this getting ready. A group of people have been brought together. You're trying to figure out how do we get these people bonded, collaborating, producing. One of the things I think deserves talking about is this idea of product discussions. Um, some places I coach, I think they're trying to get people to come together by uh, getting them, making them happy. And I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't have happy people. I read a book last year called Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple Computing. And the author said, it's not as important to make sure that people are happy, but to make sure they're fulfilled. And I think it was a really poignant statement that scares some people. Because one of the things I think makes people fulfilled and therefore happy is when they're proud of what they're producing. The thing they're producing is significant to them. So I chose three dimensions, storytelling, product context, and a lot of the questions were around distributed work. So I want to touch on that around like some of the ways to get people connected across locations. So if you seen me talk or if I've coached at your company, you've probably heard about this idea of story maps or personas, simply sketches, obviously I didn't invent these. This is a way I think that's a little bit different than maybe how some things have been done um, with backlogs to date. Now I want to I want to mention at this point, last year someone brilliantly reminded me that before things were called user stories, they were just called stories. And the whole point was to start discussions. So this is kind of a renaissance back to that with a few more things added in. And I think it starts bringing people together around a stronger context. So this little persona speaks to who is trying to do what. And these are some goals. Then typically what we do with groups is we say, let's come up with some examples. What would be a simple example? What would be a really hard example? I think, like the book Specifications by Example, examples start a very concrete discussion. They bring people together. So now you have this larger map, this story map, which is a vehicle for telling her story. She's trying to do this. Oh, really? Give me an example. If you start with the simple one, and you walk through and you start telling that story, you start building out this map. So instead of stories being a set of discrete things, which was really powerful when we started using them because there was this dialogue aspect, now we're starting to connect them back into what we've often been calling a slice, something someone's trying to accomplish. If you hang some sketches across the top, now you have one more dimension for bringing people together to have a very important discussion about user use and context. But not every context is the same. So in the bottom here is a straight product context. This happens to be a group of people building a game. This context is a little bit different where it's not so much user focused, it's starting to touch the scaling piece because it's a system and the subsystems. And I think being aware of that context gets people to think less about the process and more about the product or about the production. Another thing I want to mention just in this space is how do you do this stuff if you're distributed so all these things have cards all over the place which would be my preference always. But I'm all up for using tools that work well. That's why I'm on this phone call uh, on this webinar with version 1 because Theirs was one of the first tools where I felt like I was spending more time talking about I wanted to what I wanted to instead of talking about the tool. Cardboard is a tool we've been working on um, to try and get people doing distributed ideation. And it's basically our joke is if Google Docs and Post-it Notes had a child, it would be cardboard because two people can be working across different locations, grabbing cards and moving them around. And it truly is just that cards on a wall, but it brings people together around product thinking. 
The next of the items that I wanted to talk about at the team level is how do you start getting productive? Like the question I always ask people is how much process is enough? And Andy was joking about me being called the dude and this joke of dude's law came from having so many conversations with people spinning about how to do the process and I thought this isn't really what matters, it's the outcomes of the process that really matter and dude's law is simply based on Ohm's law which says that you know if voltage remains constant and current goes up or resistance goes up, current goes down, well dude's law is my little collaboration or collabometer which says if people are only talking about how and they're forgetting about why then they tend to get less value. Now when people are learning and they're coming together and they're trying to come up with a collaborative process there might be extra dialogue about how but across time I think what you're looking for is something more like how becomes normalized and you start challenging yourself to say well why are we doing this and then value goes up. Interestingly enough Andy Paul being a math major told me that in my equation how couldn't equal zero and I told them when how equals zero you get infinite value but it's one of many tools that I use to get people thinking in a different way to say we're supposed to be coming together to produce something instead of spinning around the latest technology or the latest process or even the latest tool. This is a group of people, a couple people who are doing some planning that I think have all the things they need around them. So now whether they're doing this with cards or whiteboards or a tool, it's more about having the right context. So this is kind of a horizon. Where are we going? This is their um, early getting their technical house in order, affectionately called iteration zero. And what's most important in this picture is that they have the skills they need to come together to do product thinking. So they have someone with a technology background and someone with a business or a product perspective. It turns out that in this case this person is a developer and that's an interesting dimension because she has been working in this industry for over a decade so she knows in this context what they need to do. And one of the pictures I find myself drawing a lot, I can't remember, I think I might have been influenced by uh, Jeff Patton on this one when people say well who are the people you need to do product thinking and planning. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I like this picture because he said to me, you need the people that understand the value, valuable, usable, and feasible. And I think that little Venn diagram is a good way to start saying, if we're struggling to collaborate, maybe it's because we're missing one of those dimensions. Um, I asked someone from version one to send me a picture of their standup because I've been in their standup and I think it has the right level of kind of collaboration and progress and questioning. And what I see us doing sometimes when people are actually struggling to truly collaborate is instead of figuring out what the problem is around them coming together, people fall into following a process. The process I'm speaking of is the infamous three questions. Now if these work for you, you can feel free to avoid this comment. But I find myself in quite a few stand-up meetings where someone says, yesterday I was in meetings all day, today I'm in meetings all day, no blockers. And to me, that the, one, of my challenges I, or one of the challenges I see with, with the three questions is we're asking people to work in teams and collaborate, but then we're asking them to report individually. And where I pe see people being successful is they have a story wall over here and people are speaking to the stories. So now you have individuals saying, hey, here's my idea or hey, here's my challenges. But it's about how are we doing these things done that are of value. And I think that's where sometimes people are getting lost. And affectionately I've heard that called talking to the wall, talking to the stories. You can still go around at the end and talk through individual stuff if you want to. The other thing I would suggest for helping people with their stand-ups is I see a lot of people trying to do too deep a solutioning in 15 minutes or less. So they take a very hard problem and they try and solve it quickly and often come up with a simplistic solution. Not simple, but simplistic, fragile. And one of the things I always teach people is say, when people go from discovery to the solution and they're struggling, you know, stop and say, okay, wait a minute, it feels like we're trying to solve this in a short amount of time. 
what are we talking about, number one? It helps everyone kind of get grounded on the same question, the same challenge. Two, who would like to be involved in that conversation? Which to me speaks to the essence of what we're trying to do with stand-ups is I loved them because I thought they were meeting killers instead of just another bad meeting. And then three, who would like to lead that conversation? Which I think is a nice way to start growing leaders, leadership internally. We're not asking an individual to solve it. We're actually asking that individual to bring a group of people together to have a dialogue around a challenge. The third one is a, a little weirder technique that I use from a coaching perspective, and it's interestingly um, a lot of people in from the lean space to do root cause analysis will you steal from Taiichi Ono and talk about the five whys to get down to the root which I think works well when you're trying to kind of understand what, some, how something's broken like a robot or a piece of code. I think if you do that with individuals, especially in a stand-up or in a collaborative environment, many times people that are scared become more scared or nervous or they're introverted. And so uh, I have a good friend that's an anthropologist and he's taught me an enormous amount about working with people. And what I've watched him do and he's validated this when I asked him, is he's observing someone. So you're putting it in the context of coaching. I see someone on a team that's struggling. They're scared. They're challenged. They're, um, they don't feel like they have the power to say something. And I'll be in a stand-up thinking, why is that person not talking about this very important thing that we all need to be talking about? And I'll go through a silent set of five whys to try and get down to why they're not saying that. And then it helps me not have that person ever feel like they're being interrogated um, because many times the five whys out loud can be very tough on a lot of people. And obviously someone that created Dude's Law, these are all nice concrete tools, but I'm also up for doing other things to just make connections. It doesn't have to be a daily stand-up. So I meet a lot of people via polycoms or some phone system. And I realize that sitting on the other end of those systems can be exhausting if you're always trying to listen and people are speaking quietly. And I see that people will um, ask someone to speak up a few times and then they'll sort of give up. And so I'm always talking very loud into those polycoms. And I think many people that I meet think that I'm angry and I'm just trying to communicate. And so I've watched and stolen ideas from people. And as soon as there's any distribution where there could be us and them lingo, whether one is group is dominant or another, I think if you rotate who goes first, then you challenge everyone to kind of come together to be part of the discussion. But if you set up a model where we always go first and then they go second, there's an instant subordination that happens all the time. And one of the things I try and do in coaching distributed groups, if possible, is to go to either location and look at the body language and the, and the physical language and the things that are being radiated to say, you know, is that there? And this simple exercise of rotating who goes first helps challenge people to show up ready to start the discussion from either side. On a simpler level, I feel like a lot of times someone that's on the phone is struggling to get into a conversation, whereas when you're sitting with people, it's a little bit easier. So oftentimes in remote sessions, I'll start with a little goofy test-driven piece, and I'll say, if you're on the phone and you have something to say, just start punching the three key. And it, I thought it was goofy at first, and then I've watched how it allows people to break into the middle of a dialogue that might, they might otherwise just sit and listen to and have maybe a whole bunch of items back up on their, in their queue to the point where they forget about the, the first three because they're just thinking about the last one. It sounds goofy, but it's really a simple tool that drives kind of distributed collaboration. Even more goofy, or, um, or I should say more concrete, is to say, let's take these people and turn them into real people. Now this one I stole from Christopher Avery. It's probably a, a very common facilitator thing, but anytime you're in a distributed session, just putting people's names on little post-its on the phone starts humanizing them. Um, other people will say, you know, if there's someone in the room here, they'll pair these two up so that 
these people are making a connection outside. That's another common model to try and get distributed groups having the right dialogue. And I'm spending a significant amount of time talking about this immediate connection of like a daily meeting, a daily stand-up, a daily connection, because it's so fundamental to scaling things beyond that. If you don't have it internal to those groups, it's very hard to do that across those groups. On an even more goofy level, these are a couple of crazy little things I've done. This is one I just kind of put out on the table and I started everyone kind of getting to move this little piece of paper back and forth to say how collaborative we're being. Um, this is another thing I've done in organizations where one or more people might start talking quite a bit as we've given everyone these sticks based on that old uh, meow, 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 meow commercial. So when someone starts talking quite a bit, someone can start waving their stick and if only one person does it, maybe that person's just poor, but when four or five people start looking at you and kind of you're going meow, 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 then it's a funny way to diffuse the fact that someone might be orating instead of having the group collaborating. I don't know how well that transfers in a webinar, but it is funny and humor is a powerful tool to get people connecting. The last one I wanted to touch on has to do with Kanban walls. So this looks more like a practice, but I think it's a really neat addition that I start seeing pop up all over the place, which is instead of this being the end, add something on the end which says, did you actually deliver something of value? How are you measuring that? Unit sold, has satisfaction watching people work, real-time feedback, and that's different in different models. That's harder in some models, like if you're building a pacemaker, but if you're closer to the user, it's a really powerful tool that starts a whole new conversation about not did we just get it done, but are we doing the right thing, which is, I think, higher order thinking. In the last of talking from a team perspective, saying, okay, you know, how do you stay productive across time? Um, part of that is, I think, are you building the right thing? And then learning from the past, uh, whether you call those demos and retrospectives or uh, user testing and reflective thinking. Um, I was struck by this when it kind of came out, and one of the things I think is interesting for people is that this is kind of all the stuff in the Agile space, and I don't really care if it's extreme programming or Scrum or Kanban or whatever. I've been thinking about this more as like this is your delivery space down here, and this is your discovery space up here. So how are you learning about users? These guys are using this term customer development. And I see a lot of people kind of talking and being cited about lean startup space, but I see fewer people actually trying to say, how are we actually going to use that feedback? And, you know, this idea of um, insight or feedback or data kind of assumes that delivery is working. And I've been thinking about it kind of from the same perspective maybe a physics professor would, which is assume delivery is a constant. You're trying to solve a hard physics problem and you say assume acceleration is a constant. Well, assume delivery is a constant. And if you've practiced for a while, you might have gotten fairly good at this stuff. And then the next part, harder part, is are you building the right thing? Because now you're talking about people and they're kind of ambiguous. And so I just wanted to plant that seed because I think that starts more of the higher order discussion about building the right thing. Now it assumes that you've worked hard at this delivery side. You have a responsive ecosystem. And the last one that I want to maybe challenge a little bit is retrospectives. And, and I've learned a lot from a lot of really good facilitators about how to start discussions like, you know, facilitator 101 is don't ask yes or no questions. But I've also seen people, this is uh, Kurt Christensen who does coaching for DevJam, and I've watched Kurt bring his information in that he's seen working with a group, and without pushing them in a direction, pull that information in to challenge them. And I kind of feel like that might be the difference between facilitating and coaching. If you're a coach, and you're there to challenge that group, and you're asking them an honest question about something you observed, I think that starts stronger dialogue. Now, it might be that the group is very reflective and they won't do it, but uh, sometimes I think some of the discussion of, like, the team does this, the team does that, sometimes the teams need to be challenged 
and I that's kind of maybe a definition of what I would say is the job of a coach. So that was some things within teams, and now I want to talk a little bit about across teams, or what maybe groups will often call a program. We've worked with programs of 19 teams, programs of six teams, programs of three teams. What I've learned is as soon as there's more than two teams, it's more than twice as hard. And there's a lot of different way groups are structured. Sometimes it's a producer-consumer relationship. Sometimes it's a big product, and there's teams that are split out by location. Um, this model, to me, when there's a group of developers here and a group of testers here, this doesn't. This is not what I'm really talking about. That feels like a distributed single team. And I, I, in thinking about collaboration, one of the jokes I often make is, "Don't mistake crowds for collaboration." And what I mean by that is. In these larger programs, I think people just try to scale something that worked with a small group. And so they start having many people in what they want to have it as a discussion. And 40 people don't do too many things spontaneously, maybe a stadium wave. And there's ways to scale these things up. And I kind of wanted to walk through that with you. But before I show you a simple model that we use, I want you to think about who else does this well. So we don't get stuck in this not invented here syndrome. And I think one of the groups that does this well that's referenced in this book is large scale construction, which is an interesting metaphor for me or an example for me to choose because we're not constructing things. But the story in this book that's nice is about building large scale structures and how there are problems as those structures go up. It's not as simple as just um, welding things together and how they're doing this cross-disciplinary collaboration with what we would call visual planning tools. So if you're interested in learning someone else's style, this might be a good read. Um, if we look at this program level collaboration from three perspectives, just to, for time's sake, and we step into the team perspective, one of the things that we've been doing for a long time that I'm surprised isn't, at, isn't more known, people tend to be kind of real amazed when we bring this in, is we might do like in a day, like a cross-cutting discussion, maybe 60 minutes. And we'll have, you know, cross-cutting people in here. We might have architecture people in here, people that are truly thinking about systems, if it's a systems context, maybe a product manager, and then, you know, maybe a director, maybe um, a tech person, maybe someone from ops. The people that are thinking across the groups. Working with them will be these discrete teams and number of teams. And there's this the cross-cutting group that we're trying to get into room together are these, these leadership people. And then from each team, someone that's thinking about technology and product or business. So this group might be listening to this. And then they take it back into their team planning. Their team planning could go really fast. Maybe they buzz through it in an hour. Maybe it takes them a handful of hours, 60 to 180 minutes or whatever. And it could be that their group is the long pole. They're the constraint across all the other groups, whereas this group right here has very little cross-cutting need, and they can do whatever planning style they want. The thing that's, I think, nice about this model is we're not driving people towards having everyone do the same process. We're trying to drive towards the same outcomes, because this discussion is about what are the goals. This discussion is about how is my team working. And then down here, we'll get this same leadership group again together, and we'll talk about what are the dependencies or what are the constraints. Now, if you're interested, I can connect you up with some people that we've used this with, but I like this because I didn't invent it. It's just something I watched evolve kind of from 2000 to 2003, and if I blogged more than once in my life. My second blog would be called Everything I Learned in 2003 that I didn't tell my friends because this has what Nassim Taleb calls evidence of success. It's been used many times. This is not just my crazy idea. And it seems to work really well. I've used it with you know programs of 12 teams where we have to figure out kind of how to deal with 12 groups here, but it tends to have that smaller group so you don't end up with just a horde 
or a large crowd, but it also allows people to come together as discrete teams and have very strong discussion. And, and it's a really nice way to get that cross-cutting information down at the team level. Um, back to the story mapping side, so if we go away from people and planning to products, this is an example of a group that's doing story mapping, and you can see it's all the stuff I was talking about. Here's a persona, here's those examples, simple and hard. They're walking through a day in the life, and they're building out this map. They have some higher order activities, and they have some pieces down here. And what happens at a cross-cutting level is this might be the split between team A and team B, just to keep it really simple. So now you could have like a producer-consumer relationship, and that's a very common model that we see. It could be split across multiple teams, but it's a product being built by multiple teams, and it's not magic. The story mapping concept is just gives you a visualization, a context to pull all those teams together when you're trying to have, like for instance, a more meaningful scrum of scrums. You don't have discrete people reporting from teams, you have teams that are trying to collaborate around a common goal like a thread through this story map talking about how they're doing, which I think is much more powerful to like a product manager whose focus might not be on teams A, B, and C. And that's another way that like the story map is just a simple visualization that helps people have a better dialogue. It's not a better document. The last piece that I think isn't getting enough airplay is what Fred Brooks once called accidental complexity. There's so many tools out there for us to start seeing into the complexity that exists at a systemic level or a multiple team level or a product program level. And I just chose a simple one like Sonar. And it's still surprising to me that over 10 years into the movement or, you know, a handful of years of these tools being around, how few people are still using these. And unlike trying to understand product, which is ambiguous and diverse and elusive, this stuff is fairly concrete. I heard someone say that anything we don't automate, the machines get together at night and laugh at us for. And I thought that was a good joke because these tools do an enormously good job telling the story of the code, exposing the complexity, building these heat maps to say, you know, something's good here, something's bad here, something's more bad here. So this tool is called Sonar, pretty vanilla in a lot of places where I see people doing really well, not so much in other groups where this accidental complexity is growing in their code base. So one other picture I want to show you that I think really helps people, um, I find especially like this is good to challenge kind of traditional thinking and I think it speaks to learning across teams, it also works within teams, is that for years and years our deep ethos was, you know, analysis, design, implement, and test. And we made this argument that like, if we understood the problem better, then we would be, do a better job getting to where the money is. And time marches on, so time is on this continuum. And I think the collaborative discussion is like, well, what happens when the money moves over here? And in a traditional model, you're stuck. You're possibly starting again because you haven't got anything done. At this point, you have 50% of 100% done. Now, if you think about that language I used earlier and you say, let's do some discovery and then let's start trying to get there, you know, in some iterative fashion and out here is where we think the money is. At this point, you have, you know, 100% of 10% done, not drawn to scale. And then you have like, you know, 100% of 20% and then the money moves or the value moves or your ability to be competitive moves. A neat collaborative discussion is this, like what stops you from going to where you need to? Now, I love that discussion from a collaborative perspective because it's not about how many agile practices are we doing. It's about what are the constraints that stop us from going where we need to when the money's moved. It's not a difficult picture, but like a lot of things, it's a simple starter to have the right discussions happening that maybe aren't about adding more process, more technology. Homing in on coming up to the end 
of the talk here and trying to jam as much as I can into a 40 minute window. I wanted to talk about this idea of like outside teams or you know portfolios or across portfolios and I almost put a question mark there but I didn't so I put it here because you know who is really on the outside so you know the hippie in me would like to say no one should be on the outside but the reality in my day-to-day -day coaching is there are some people that are very far away from um, understanding the value of using Agile methods to produce things early, to learn sooner, to validate products, to show investments. And I just chose this as a frame, ideators, the people that came up with the idea. You know, hopefully they're not on the outside, but many times they are. Um, the people that are investing, instead of calling people executives or sponsors or stakeholders. I like investment-based thinking. And then the people that are leading. So the ideators, I think that's going back to this lean startup. This is a nice picture because they're saying, hey, I think if we do this, it might return good results. And I like this dialogue of hypothesis or insights because it says, we don't know, but we think this is right. And then this is your delivery cycle down here. So now to me, it doesn't matter if this is Scrum or Kanban or XP. It's more a duration. You know, how fast can we get that feedback back to something that's meaningful? Not just how fast can we get stuff done. That might be some language we need to start challenging. How fast can we validate something, which challenges us to feed in things that are significant that are beyond work units? Because I think that's what connects you with these people. They're out here thinking about that, hopefully. The next set of people that I hear demonified a lot, especially by some of the people down in the trenches that are working really hard, is the big boss. And one of the things I've seen is that I think a lot of these leadership folks, we've only given them one question to answer, which is, when will it be done? Here's how much it costs. When will it be done? Or how much will it cost? And I've been working hard to try and say, do they not know other questions to ask? Have they given up on some of those other questions? Are we speaking to them in the right language? And some of the questions I think you can get these people to start dialoguing is what is done, and then if you speak to how valuable it is, now you're starting to have kind of the right conversation. And I think a lot of those people I meet, when I sit down and have time to talk with them, I think they feel like I, I gave up asking that question, or maybe they've been conditioned to think in big blocks, and it's time for us to start breaking that down and start thinking about investments. Uh, once when I was at version one, one of the things that happened I thought was really nice is someone said this story is X points, and someone else said that's N dollars. And I thought that was such a neat conversation. It was struck me like, why do not more people not speak in whatever currency, hard currency they're using? And it might be because they're scared or they haven't really figured out this discovery side, the delivery side. Once you get good at this delivery side, then that becomes the next dialogue. And if you're less scared of it, you're closer to having value-based discussions. The last thing I wanted to put in is I asked the version one guys for a snapshot because for a very long time, I've been talking to them about this within, across, and outside teams. And I think a lot of people in the leadership space aren't given the view they want. And I'm, I'm going to let them kind of talk about this in their session, but I think it's one of the things that their tool, one of very few tools, does well, which speaks to those questions that aren't about how did this team do in these two weeks, but answers a more difficult question of how are we doing on this larger initiative the ability to take big things, decompose them, and recompose them iteratively promotes an enormous amount of program and portfolio level collaboration. So wrapping up, I want to just kind of challenge you to say, are the skeptics pushed on the outside of your world? And skepticism, I think, is a healthy thing. Cynicism is painful, but skeptics are a good thing, and I want to leave you with this quote from Nassim Taleb who said, you know, avoid epistemic arrogance, the difference between what you know and what you think you know, and that's a good way to walk in and promote more dynamic collaboration by not telling people, no, this is how we've done this, you're not doing it right. And if you want a very concrete thing of how to put these questions to work, I tried to 
have something to say, I think if we look at how we've changed things across time. We used to talk about like what's required and the new discussion is about what's needed or how many hours versus how much is produced. And I won't go into all these, but I kind of broke them into, you know, thinking about planning or products, thinking about work. Like I know there's a lot of people that are starting an anti-estimation effort. I wonder if they also do that when they hire a contractor to come work on their house. I don't think estimating is evil. I think evil estimation is evil, making people suffer. But switching the conversation from how big to too big is a fundamental one. Switching from we got to get better at estimating to learning from estimates is an essential part of helping people get productive. And then the last one would be um, in the tech space, like switching from talking about code to talking about tests. If you can promote that kind of dialogue, then if you don't get hung up on test driven as write the test then write the code, and if you think about it as a design tool, you're trying to get people to collaborate in the coding space around what outcomes they're looking for instead of how the code is structured. And my experience is by asking what outcome you want, you tend to write less of the wrong code. Doing less of the wrong thing is one way to get more done without actually generating any more energy. And I think Ian's probably thinking that I'm right on the edge of my time, which I think I am. Um, Version one, you can you get access to this, the recording Andy was talking about, this one pager we're going to produce, and all the information about their, you know, the series that they're doing like this, because there's been a previous talk, there's going to be more, and the follow-up talk that Andy's going to do. Um, on the DevJam side, I did a video series of like a lot of the things we talked about for the Pragmatic Bookshelf, and I recently asked the pragmatic guys if it would be okay to just give it away, and they were generous enough to do that. So there's a series of one-hour videos out on the DevJam site that talk about a lot of topics where collaboration is a theme through them, chartering, personas. Um, we tried to put a new spin on planning of like planning to discover and planning to deliver instead of just the mechanics of planning. But I'm going to turn things back over to Andy to see if we have some questions that went unanswered or some things people would like to hear addressed. Andy? Thanks, David, and uh, thanks for taking us through those thoughts. I know I learned a couple uh, couple new uh, tricks that, that I'll look to uh, employ here at version one, and uh, I wanted to start with a question. Um, Andy, are you going to use the meow, meow, meow stick? <laughs> I, I was waving it. Didn't you? Didn't you see me? No, um, I didn't. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, the first question is, um, what are kind of what are the five lies? A couple people were asking. Didn't really have a lot of background on that. So I was hoping maybe yeah. you could give just a maybe an example of when you've used the five lies with a little yep. more richness, because I think that would be really, it's a great tool to, mm -hmm. to use, and the silent aspect was new to me. So the idea of, like, if you're trying to understand um, why production is jammed up, this is where it came from in Toyota, and you say, oh, well, it's the problem is, is that this guy isn't producing enough units because he doesn't know how to do his job. Well, that might not be the real issue. The might, issue might be you switch him from job to job, so you say, well, why is this person struggling? Oh. They're struggling because they don't know how to do their job. Why do they not know how to do their job? Well, we switch them from job to job all the time. And then you realize that going to send that person to training isn't helpful. That's kind of the root cause analysis as far as flow and operations. When I'm standing in a stand-up with someone, I think, you know, why is this person not talking? I, maybe they're scared of this person next to them. Yeah, they're scared of that person next to them. Why are they scared of that person next to them? Well, that person next to them in the stand-up might say things like, you got to take that offline. And you do that to an introverted person, that might be the last time they're, they're risky enough to step up and ask that question. Why does that person want to shut them down? Well, maybe that person's scared of what this other person's going to say. And you get down to the bottom, and if really the bottom of it, whether it's five whys or three whys, is that there's an issue that people don't feel comfortable talking about. As the coach, I'm happy to name that issue without naming the individuals. And it's I coached this really brilliant Dutch team once, and of the many things they taught me is was the difference between in the States, people say, I didn't want to step on his toes, and in the Netherlands, 
they say, I don't worry, I don't have big toes. Now, my experience in the Netherlands that I like was people will talk directly to the problem and off the individual. And that's how I use those silent whys. It's trying to roll up, Andy, what I've noticed so I can maybe get to talking about the thing instead of talking to the individual. That, I think, makes people feel less threatened. Okay, great. Yeah, that, I think that uh, would help out those, those questions that came through. Uh, and another question that, that came through kind of at the end of the session, it was someone who was saying, hey, you know, we, we kind of have the, the team level working, we think, pretty well. And, and you did mention how you know, it gets uh, with 10 times as hard once you get two teams. And so what, is, what advice do you have for a group that maybe is, is taking that, they're getting to just enough scale where they, they have to go from single team to multi-team. You know, um, anything in particular you'd, you'd say, hey, focus on, on this part of your collaboration or the way you're structuring yourself? Yeah, so I felt like one of the mistakes I made early on as coaching is I had success working with discrete teams, and then I just decided everybody should do that. It was arrogant and naive and dumb. And I learned to kind of go in and start understanding the context that you're coaching inside of. So let's just say um, you're doing really well. You have 12 people that are really collaborating, and suddenly you hit this bump where it feels like the cells should divide, and you start saying, well, how are we going to split things? Most people will talk about splitting things across features, like feature teams, and I think that's smart because then the division is based on the, the business, that you're, the value you're trying to deliver in product, but that's not always the right way to go. You know, I mean, there are still groups out there where there's like maybe a calculation engine that's a, often called a back-end team and a front-end team that's consuming from that. In fact, I got into coaching because the very first white paper I wrote was called The Company Customer, where there was a group of people that came up with an internal solution that suddenly everybody wanted to use. And it was kind of a skunk works project. And that's a classic model of they're not ready to have all those consumers. So part of the answer to the question is understanding the context. By and large, I think splitting into whole groups that can deliver whole things that you can measure is the right way to go. Um, another dimension or as contextual aspect has to do with location. I mean, Yuta Epstein, the book Agile and a Large, and a lot of things Yuta has done and other people have spoken to by location, if you can create whole teams that allows people to come together and bond, that's just not always the way you can, you don't always have that opportunity to grow that. I mean, I could feel like I could go on and on, Andy. Maybe maybe we can figure out a way to field some of these questions and along with the one pager, put some answers back to people on one of our sites. I, I just want to see if there's some other questions we might want to get to. Yeah. Um, th Change the topic a little bit. Uh, another question we had come through was, was uh, I think someone who was saying, "Hey, yeah, we struggle with how to collaborate, um, you know, and, and recommendations for getting kind of executive buy-in for coaching to improve our collaboration." So, um, what are your what are your kind of take? Yeah. I, I know you do offer uh, coaching through Dev Jam, and so what have you seen to be successful when, when someone is trying to message internally about the value behind it uh, to uh, the leadership in their organization? And the metaphor there that you mentioned is an investment metaphor. How do you get someone to buy in? I mean, if you go back to Dale Carnegie, you have to know what they're interested in buying. I made a lot of mistake for a lot of years of talking to leaders about process instead of essence, context, or outcomes. So um, one of the things we're doing in some of these interviews is sitting, early interviews from a coaching perspective, is sitting with the leadership group asking them questions of like, how do you work today? What do you think you guys do well? What are your challenges? What would you like to see change? And what constraints? And then we'll sit with discrete teams and have that same conversation. And then we'll bring that back and compare those two and sometimes the teams that they're all are all gung ho, they're really excited, but the leadership isn't. Sometimes it's the opposite. So we have that benefit as being outsiders. When we're teaching people internally to do that, um, like what we've done to grow coaching inside organizations is to teach them to do the same thing. Um, one or two teams start using agile methods and things start going well, and then you get this dangerous possible level of agile fever. 
and everybody starts doing Agile, and the leadership group might see that might feel like it's kind of chaotic because their perspective is these groups aren't working well together even though they're working well as individuals. And that's just one example, Andy, of I think if you're trying to get people to buy in, you have to know what their perspective is. Even that question for a lot of people on teams is a good challenge. Like, let's assume that the leadership group at your company wants to do the right thing. What questions would they be asking if we were trying to sell this stuff to them? Because I think talking to them about Scrum and Kanban and XP is not the right way to go. All right, thank you. Uh, and so along the same lines, uh, we had uh, another question. And it, this felt more like a, related to, to coaching, and it was it was a specific to uh, kind of with within that team. And you talked about you know the stand up meeting, you wanting to. Uh, really get people to, to take the problem solving discussion outside the team. And uh, th their question was kind of how do you encourage uh, that the kind of behavior within the team? Uh, so any, any suggestions you'd give to, to help a team kind of move towards that approach from a, from a coaching standpoint? So I wasn't so much saying take it outside of the team. I was trying to get at that I think some people try to solve hard problems in two minutes or less than a stand-up. And I think this definitely, for me, comes from working in a lot of distributed environments where people just aren't talking about the same thing. And when I see people struggling to go from discovery to solution, then I think you can stop and say, hey, you guys, what are we talking about? And if you can't do that, then continuing that discussion is not collaboration. It's kind of noise. So... It's a gentle way to get people to take that stuff outside. So if part of the question is how do you get that collaboration happening outside, um, I said name what you're talking about, ask who wants to be involved, and ask someone to take ownership of it. If no one takes ownership of it, then I might do that from a coaching perspective. But that's also a tell for me around the level of collaboration. If people don't want to take ownership of just starting a discussion, there's usually something going on below that that's a fear that's in the room or some lack of people feeling like they can take power and do it. Did that answer the question, Andy? I think it did. Yeah, I, I, did, I think they, they were they were maybe missed the, the point around the, the, the guidance you gave around how to um, kind of formalize taking that uh, discussion in stand-up that delves, delves into problem solving outside of the stand-up so the team can, can talk about it later. Uh, so that's helpful, uh, and I know we're we're kind of butting up against uh, the the end of the hour here. So I did have one final question that I thought um, would be pertinent at this point, and it was uh, someone came through and said, um, "How do you deal with being so awesome?" Uh, and so I, I just wanted to thank you, David, for uh, providing such a, a helpful hour for us here today. And you don't have to answer that one. I know it's hard to, hard to answer, but uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm happy to. I mean, anyone, whoever said that, they can come hang out with me and see me on my less awesome moments, but I, it's a very nice thing for someone to say. I just think we all should just assume everybody's trying to do the right thing and assume you don't know what you don't know so you're always open to having the next best discussion all right thanks for joining everyone we look forward to seeing you next week thanks andy all right thank you